I do have a great twin day picture, but in uh, the craziness of switching computers, uh, for you that weren't last. For you that weren't here last week, had a little mishap with my computer in chapel. If you haven't seen it, I think it's online, so you can watch the video when you go home. But uh, I'll see if I can dig it up. But in light of that, uh, everyone's been bugging about my wedding picture. So guys, there is hope for you, all right? <laughs> this proves it. So if you're feeling a little down or discouraged, just know there is hope for you too. What was the date for that day? That was May 22nd. 2004. So we just celebrated 10 years of marriage this May. So, talking about grace, we uh, began on Monday by talking about the fact that God desires to occupy our lives with His grace. Did I do something funny? Oh, all right, I heard somebody laughing, and usually that means I've sort of misspelled something. I know the last slide I left up yesterday was misspelled. I typed it up right before chapel and did not proofread it, so I apologize for that. How many of you caught it? <laughs> All right, good. The rest of you were asleep. As soon as I left chapel, I opened up my laptop and thought, hmm, that's great. That's the one I left up the longest. <laughs> But we talked about the fact that, that God desires that we would be occupied by grace, that, that, that he would fill our lives with his grace, and we talked yesterday about how grace makes us free. But one of the things I've noticed is, is sometimes it's really hard to accept and live in that freedom. So I want to ask you a question this morning as we get started. What makes you tired? And are you tired right now? How many of you are tired? All right. It must be contagious and going around. What, what are some of the things that make you tired? Just tell me some of the things that make you tired. Lack of sleep will do it for sure. Exercise. Exercise. Stress. Stress. All right. What a, too much concentration. <laughs> Siblings. <laughs> Roommates. <laughs> Roommates that want to talk all night. Yes, they will keep you tired. All right, there are a lot of things that, that make us tired, and obviously we understand physical tiredness. We understand that if we don't get enough sleep and we don't get enough rest, that we will be physically tired. But there's, like we said, there's tired that also comes from other sources, stress, things like that. How about trying to please people? Think that makes you tired? How many of you ever kind of thought yourself in that place where you're trying to make someone happy and you just felt like it was wearing you out? Anybody like that? I think sometimes we get in that place where we just feel like we're trying to please someone, we're trying to fulfill the, the demands that are on us, the, the pressures, the challenges, whether it's at school, whether it's in music, and we're trying to measure up, we're trying to make someone pleased with us. And I want you to know that you're not alone. In fact, thousands of years ago, there was a group of people that were experiencing the same sort of struggle. And if you have your Bible, we're going to start in the book of Exodus this morning. Exodus chapter 6. And then we're going to look at another chapter in Exodus and hopefully spend a little time in Galatians. So, Exodus chapter 6. And as we move into Exodus chapter 6, we, we're going back in time thousands of years and we're entering the land of Egypt. And in the land of Egypt, there was a massive slave force that Pharaoh was using to accomplish his building projects. And of course, these slaves were of Hebrew descent. You'll remember that... that the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, have ended up in Egypt after Joseph brings his family down there to rescue them from the famine. But after a change of pharaohs and circumstances, they become slaves. And over the years, they have multiplied into a great, great number of people. And they are there working as slaves under Pharaoh. They're building bricks under the hot Egyptian sun. They are pressured to fulfill a daily quota. They have to please taskmasters who are shouting and threatening and beating. So they are facing pressure. They were a tired people. People who were trying to please an impossible taskmaster. And I think very much we realize that they were people who wondered, does God really care about what we're going through? Does God really see our struggle? Does he really have anything to offer? They had heard the stories about this God who had begun a relationship with Abraham and they had heard the stories of Joseph but these stories had happened hundreds of years before. Were they really true? Did God really care? Did he see their struggle? Well, of course we know that God did see their struggle and God did care and God did have an answer and a plan and God raised up Moses to deliver his people. 
And in the Exodus chapter 6, we're in the middle of that deliverance, but before things got better, they got worse. And so as Moses is going to Pharaoh and demanding that the people be let go and the plagues start to come, Pharaoh only hardens his heart and he actually increases the burden of the, Egypt, of the, of the Hebrews. And so they go from having to make bricks with straw and mud to just mud. And if they want straw, they have to get it themselves. So here in Exodus chapter 6, we read these words. It says, So therefore, say therefore to the people of Israel, this is God's instruction to, to Moses. He says, Say there to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And you know the story. How many of you are familiar with the story of the Exodus, right? All right, you're familiar with the story of the Exodus. God indeed does deliver on that incredible promise. Wasn't that an amazing promise? He says, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to redeem you with great acts of judgment. I'm going to take you to be my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And finally, the tenth plague, after the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh relents and he lets the people go. And God leads them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They see his mighty power. They've seen his power in the plagues. They've seen his power in the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Then he rips open the Red Sea. You remember when they were trapped? Right? He rips open the Red Sea, he puts a highway there, and he leads them across, and then he feeds the army of pharaohs to the fish. You remember the story? Right? They saw the incredible power of God. They experienced his deliverance and his freedom and his rescue. But something very, very interesting happens just a few weeks later. Just a few, few days, really, down the road, if you will, and we see what happens. Look over in Exodus chapter 16. In, in Exodus chapter 16, as they are now on this journey towards this land that, that God has promised them, a place that the Bible describes as flowing with milk and honey, as a place of abundance, of, of blessing, and of rest. And yet something very strange happens. It says, they set out from Elam, it's Exodus chapter 16 verse 1, they set out from Elam and the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month after they departed, so the 15th day, this is a month and a half is basically what we're looking at. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So here we find these people have been delivered and rescued and they're being let out. And now they're complaining, they're grumbling. Why are they complaining? It says, And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they are running out of food, and instead of remembering what God has done for them, instead of looking back and saying, I'm sure that the God who caused the ten plagues to fall in Egypt, but protected us each time, I'm sure the God who ripped open the Red Sea, I'm sure the God who leads us by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, I'm sure he can do something about our hunger. But instead they complained, and they grumbled, and they said, it would have been better if God had killed us in Egypt. And notice something very, very interesting about their memory. Did you catch it? It said that we, we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. Do you ever notice that sometimes we don't remember all that accurately? Max Lucado says this. He says, nostalgia is no stickler for details. Meat pots? You mean bone soup. Bread to the full, you mean that moldy, crusty stuff that they fed you with? How quickly they had forgotten. So what was Moses' response? I think he said something like this. You foolish Hebrews! Right? What magician has cast an evil spell on you? How crazy are you? Don't you realize who God is and what he's done? They wanted to go back to Egypt. Can you imagine that? Now here's the thing. That's not actually what Moses said. Some of you are looking at your Bible and you're like, 
He's preaching out of a different Bible than I've got. I think we need to fire this guy. See, I know that Moses... It's actually what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. So if you have your Bible, slide all the way into the New Testament. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Because as Paul writes this letter to the church... The early Christians were doing exactly the same thing as the Hebrews did. Just in a different context. Look at what Paul says. He says, O oh foolish Galatians, what magician has cast an evil spell on you? For you used to see the meaning of Jesus Christ's death as clearly as though I showed you a signboard with a picture of Christ dying on the cross. Paul was, Paul was pretty, pretty direct and he was pretty harsh in his letter to the Galatians. Who has warped your thinking? Can you imagine as they're reading this letter and he calls them fools? Right? He says, you foolish people. He says, who has warped your thinking? What magician has cast a spell on you? He says, you used to understand what Jesus did for you as clearly as though I'd drawn a picture for you that Jesus died on the cross in your place, that he bore your sin and he absorbed the Father's wrath on your behalf and he's given you grace and freedom. And he's like, you're now wanting to go back to Egypt, to slavery. Even though You've been set free. You see, grace sometimes is so hard for us to really understand. I mean, we believe it and we receive it, but then sometimes in our Christian lives and our walks, we want to go back to grace plus, right? Grace plus my effort. Grace plus my church attendance. Grace plus something. Grace plus my rules. And the Galatian believers were struggling to rest in the grace that God had given them. It was hard for them to rest in this grace. Even Peter struggled to rest in grace. You can read about it in, in Galatians chapter 2 verse 11. And it's actually really interesting. It says Paul actually had to come to a place where he, the Bible says he withstood Peter to his face about this issue. Because what was happening was Peter was living out his freedom in Christ around some people and then around other people, around the Jewish people, he was going back and living under the law again. So he would fit in. And Paul withstood him to his face. Would you have liked to have been in the room that day? How many of you think it would have been kind of interesting to be sort of a fly on the wall when, when Paul was withstanding Peter to his face? All right, anybody? All right. It had been kind of a curious thing. So even Peter, who loved God deeply and believed and had received God's grace, struggled with this. And so if you struggle with this, you're not alone. Sometimes grace is so hard to understand and so hard to accept. But here's the thing. Whenever we add anything to grace, it's no longer grace. You see, you need to understand that you were dead in your sin. You were doomed to eternal separation from God. But God rescued you by His grace. He brought you into a living relationship with Himself. And He accomplished that for you. It's not by works. Right? So no one can boast. And just as we're not saved by works, neither do we have to in the Christian life earn God's love or favor by going back and living under the law. And that's exactly what they were doing. And really what they were doing was cheapening God's grace. Because anytime we add anything to grace, we're cheapening it. We're decreasing the value of God's grace. It was cheap to them because they added to it. They were the sort of people that were saying, yes, you need to believe in Christ, but you need to do these things too. You need to follow our rules as well. You need to do this and you need to do that if you're going to be accepted by God. Ever meet anyone like that? We do a real good job sometimes of saying that, that, that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And then we seem to make it as religious as possible. Have you ever noticed that? And that's what was happening here. They just couldn't break free from their religious past. Anytime we add or take away anything from grace, we cheapen it. Anytime that we use grace as an excuse to sin, we cheapen it. If you say, you know, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do this thing. I know it doesn't please God, but I know that He's gracious. I know that He'll forgive me. You're cheapening God's grace. You're devaluing God's grace. And you really are not understanding what His grace has accomplished for you. 
that His grace has set you free and sin makes you a slave. And when we cheapen God's grace by sinning, we are devaluing the grace of God. Look at what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Paul says, I am not one, I am not one of those who treats the grace of God as though it were meaningless. For if we could be saved by keeping the law, then there was no need for Christ to die. If anybody, if anybody was, had a tendency to be religious, it was Paul, right? He was the most religious guy around. He was the king of religion before he came to know Christ. He was a Jew of Jews and a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a keeper of the law, a teacher of the law. He was passionate about his religion. But Paul came to a place where he realized no amount of religion could make him right with God. No amount of religion could end the separation that was in his heart towards God. Only Jesus could do that. Only grace could do that. So he says, I am not one of those who treats the grace of God as though it were meaningless. He says, if we could be saved by keeping the law, if we could be saved by keeping the rules, I would have been, but I wasn't. And he says, if we could be saved by keeping the rules, there was no need for Christ to die. Grace is God's lavish gift, and it alone accomplishes your salvation, past, present, and future. And Paul wanted to drive home that point. So let's go back to chapter 3 for a minute and look at verses 2 and 3. Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3. Paul said, after calling them foolish Galatians and asking them why they're not getting it, he says, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by keeping the law? Of course not, he says. For the Holy Spirit came upon you only after you believed the message you heard about Christ. Have you lost your senses? All right? do you get what he's saying? Has anybody ever asked you, have you lost your mind? All right, how many of you had a parent say that to you? All right, you presented some idea, some plan to them, and they said, have you lost your mind? And that's exactly... <laughs> Very nice. Someone's lost their water bottle. <laughs> Paul says, have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? After starting your Christian life in the Spirit, by His grace, by His work in you, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? He said, if you've been saved by grace, then why aren't you living by grace? If you believe that Jesus has saved you by His grace, then believe that you can live by His grace in you. You see, Jesus wants to transform your life into His image. But He's not asking you to do it by trying harder in your own human effort. He wants it to be accomplished by the work of His grace in you. You know, so many times we try to grow in our Christian walk by trying harder and doing better. How many of you make New Year's resolutions? Raise your hand. All right. Just about a third of you. The rest of you have given up on the idea. How many of you have ever made one at some point in the past? All right. A lot of you. And here's what I would guess. The reason that... A lot of you are now not making them is because you got tired of making them and breaking them. Is that correct? All right, because they usually last till about January 3rd. <laughs> Maybe the 4th if you're really strong, right? And a lot of times our resolutions have something to do with our spiritual walk, right? I'm going to do really good this year. I'm going to really, I'm going to read my Bible for an hour every day. I'm going to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to, do you ever have a resolution sort of like that? I'm going to make God happy this year. And that, let me tell you, that will wear you out. Because you can't make God happy. And trying harder is not how it happens. Even in the early church, in Acts chapter 15, we're not going to go there, but they were struggling with this issue. They were adding the law back into grace. And anytime we add anything to grace, it's no longer grace. Grace plus anything equals nothing. I am not a good math student. So this is going to be the only math equation that I ever teach you. But it's an important one. Grace plus anything equals nothing. Grace plus anything equals nothing. We're saved by grace and grace alone. Anytime we add something to grace, we're really nullifying it. Paul said, I am not one of those who treats the grace of God as though it were meaningless. Let me ask you a question. 
in your walk with Christ, do you feel tired? Do you feel like though you've been trying and trying, but God somehow thinking that you don't measure up? And if that's the case, I want you to rethink how God sees you, how He looks at you, and how He wants to transform your life into His image. Because trying harder alone will never accomplish it. You'll end up feeling like an Egyptian slave, straining and striving. And God wants to set you free. He doesn't want us to go back to Egypt. Listen to Jesus' invitation. Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary. He says, If you're tired, if you've been trying to do it through your own effort and you're tired, come to me. If you have heavy burdens, and I know some of you do, He says, Come to me and I will give you what? Rest. God wants you to rest in His grace. He wants you to rest in who He is and what He's done for you. He wants you to know that His grace is constant in your life. His grace has no limits, no end. It never runs out. It never gives up. His grace is unlimited for you. And God wants you to experience rest. God wanted to give rest to His children back in Egypt. And that's why he was delivering them so he could take them to a land where they would experience his rest. And yet they wanted to go back to Egypt. And sometimes we do the same thing. God saves us from our life of sin and he shows us his power and his grace and then somehow we end up thinking, maybe Egypt was better after all. But here's the thing. Jesus was greater than Moses. God ripped open the Red Sea to free them from Egypt, but he ripped the veil in the temple for you. When Jesus died, the Bible says the veil, the place that separated the holiest place in the temple that kept everyone out except the high priest once a year, that was ripped from top to bottom. As God says, you now have access to me and to my presence and to my grace and to my rest. And he offers you something greater than Egypt. Egypt is where you have to earn your keep. Egypt is where you have to strive and strain to please a hard taskmaster. And God isn't like that. He wants to give you his rest. So don't go back to Egypt. And there's a few ways we usually go back to Egypt. Sometimes it's by thinking that we have to earn God's love and favor by trying really hard and being really good. Sometimes we go back to Egypt when we choose to live in sin. God has set you free. He doesn't want you to live in sin. Sin makes you a slave. And so Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. I know we're not real familiar with yokes anymore, but it's what it was used to tie two animals together, an ox or a horse, so that they could do work. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. He's saying, learn my way. Learn me and my way, because I am humble and gentle, and you will find what? Rest for your soul. Jesus offers you perfect rest. And I want you to be able to rest in God's grace. His grace is amazing. It's really interesting. I was beginning to develop this series of messages on grace actually last summer. And as I was preparing to share them with our church family last fall, and as I was doing that, God very much put on my heart to share this with you as well. And as I was uh, reading and preparing, a really interesting thing happened. Last August, I had the privilege to go back to Peru. Uh, I've been there the last two summers. Uh, I've gotten to go and, and be part of a team that's uh, working with a missionary there who's reaching a people group along the Ucayali River in the Amazon of Peru. And we were there, and one day after our work in the village, we went back, we stayed on a riverboat. And on the top deck of the riverboat, they had strung up a couple of hammocks. And I thought to myself, I really want to do this, but I'm clumsy. Any clumsy people out there? All right. Wow. I feel at home. <laughs> See, you know, for a clumsy person, the idea of it being a hammock is really nice, but the thought of getting into the hammock, right, is a little bit stressful. Because it could go badly. You could end up out the other side if you're not careful. So I carefully got into the hammock, and I brought a book with me about grace, and I was reading it and studying it. And I was reading a chapter that dealt with this idea of resting in God's grace. And, there, and I, this is literally like the first time I've been in a hammock in years. And as I got to the end of that chapter, it said, Rest 
in the hammock of God's grace. I thought, hmm, maybe God's trying to teach me something. When you're in a hammock, it's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? Some of you would like to be there right now. You're not going to be there today. <laughs> Sorry to break that to you. But God wants you to rest in His grace. To know that His grace is sufficient. Listen, His grace is greater than your sin. It's greater than your past. It's greater than your present. And it's greater than your future. And God wants you to rest in His grace. You don't have to earn your keep. God has chosen to offer you His love and His affection. He'll never love you any more or any less than He does right now. Your love, His love for you, is not based on your performance. It's not based on how well you do. Listen, you should practice two hours today, and if you don't, your teachers will figure it out. But God's love for you won't change whether you do or you don't. Never will His love change for you. Never will His grace run out for you. Let me, let me pray for you. Would you bow your heads this morning? Maybe for you, this concept of grace is just a struggle. You believe in it, you understand it, but you find it hard to really rest in it. You find it really hard to believe in Maybe Satan has attacked your mind to think, maybe God's grace is for other people, but maybe His grace isn't for me. And Maybe you're thinking, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know the secrets that I carry. You don't know the sin that I hide. And here's the thing, I don't know. But God does. And He loves you anyway. He wants to deal with that sin. He will deal with that sin. But His love for you never changes. You can rest in His grace today. Your past is covered by His grace. Your present is sustained by His grace. And your future is secured by His grace. Rest in that today. Father, I thank You so much for Your incredible and overwhelming grace. And Father, I pray that You would teach us and lead us to rest in that grace today and each day. Father, sometimes it's a struggle. Father, sometimes we get as crazy and foolish as the, as the Hebrews who wanted to go back to Egypt. And Father, I pray that when we, when we find ourselves in that place, that we would remember that that's a foolish decision. And instead, we would choose to accept your invitation to come to you with our burdens, with our problems, with everything, and rest in your grace. And Father, I pray that we would learn to enjoy your grace and glorify you because of it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.